Okay. Hi, I hope you're all in the right place. If you're not, then we're still going to have a great time. <laughs> so come along for the ride. Uh, today's topic is tactics for revenue models and fundraising plans. Uh, we have three fantastic, amazing speakers today that are going to walk us through. Uh, first is Nina Vial. She's the Director of Development and Communications at Northwest Education Access. And then we've got uh, Judy Caribou. For, did, I hope I got that right, Judy. Clinical therapist, former CEO and executive director. And we have a video from Emily Wills, a uh, development director of Wisconsin Youth Company. Today is logistics. Uh, for any questions or anything that you have, definitely go ahead and use the chat box. Uh, Michaela and I will be moderating that to make sure that all the uh, questions come up or any comments. Uh, if you experience techn technical difficulties, please try leaving and rejoining the meeting. Uh, the session will be recorded and a recording will be shared to you later as well uh, will the, the slides. And then please use the worksheet to take any notes through today's session that Jessica had sent you before. Um, and then also remember, um, if you need to step up, stand up, step away, we are all adults. This is an hour and a half. Uh, and I trust that uh, you are here and getting out what you need to get out of this. So um, the agenda, the first thing is we're gonna go through a little workshop with Nina. Uh, and then Judy is going to share a case study with us. And then we'll watch the video with Emily that also has a case study. Um, and first we're gonna go in with Nina. Does anyone have any questions before uh, we dive in? Okay, Nina, I am handing this off to you then. Okie doke. Uh, well, good morning. I mean, it's early, a little earlier for me, um, but I'm so glad to be joining y'all. And my name is Nina Viel. I am the Director of Development of Communications um, and Development at Northwest Education Access. I listened to the panel discussion last week, which was excellent, and it really gave such a high level and practical review of the different kinds of revenue models. So today, I'm hoping we can really get our hands dirty together and talk about in practice. There is just so much collective wisdom um, that's happening in this room, and I'm just so thrilled I get to talk with y'all and get to tap into it a little bit. So Greg, I'm ready, hit me with my next one. So I thought we could practice those vocal cords. So I'd love to hear um, what fundraising activity do you feel the most confident with and what fundraising activity really just gives you hives. And I'd love to get a little discussion going. Um, I'll go first. I love fundraising activities where I get to use communication skills. If I get to design a video or write like a digital pitch or steward a photo shoot, anything that lets me be a little more creative, something I'm really gonna like to do. And I know I'm not allowed to say this as a development director, but honestly, grants gives me hives. Just all of them, they're long, they're pretty tedious. And look, since I know we all friends here, I can say, let's just be real. A lot of those questions are completely unnecessary and really just feel like, you know, you're doing it just to do it. So totally competent, but not something I like doing. So I'd love to hear from someone else. Let me see if I can get a little view. If anyone else would like to chime in, what fundraising activity do you feel confident with? And what's something that you don't like? Well, I'm hearing crickets, so I'll jump in, Nina. Thank you, Judy. I, um, I actually do like the grant writing piece. That's where I think for me, it's a little bit creative. Um, and I think the thing that gives me hives, although I do do it, is just working myself up to make the individual ask. Mm -hmm. Now, Judy, obviously you and I have to schedule a team up because we just have <laughs> completely opposite skills. I need you on my squad to say stuff I don't want to do. It looks like Mike put something in the in the chat. Major gift fundraising I like. Fundraising events I don't like. That makes sense. Fundraising events can be so stressful. I've got over 10 years in the game and I'm still sweating more than of, you know? And I always have scissors in my purse now. Just all kinds of things can happen at events. Uh, Kristen put in, I like to work on events and I don't like having people sell things. Having Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and Casey put in, meeting with donors individually, I love. 
uh, calling sponsors to find out the names of their golf participants. What is it with, I'm telling you, I, I gotta agree with you on that, Casey. I've done a lot of golf events and you're right. It's always so difficult. It's like you can organize, um, I don't know, these golf, these golf folks, suspicious is what I'm gonna say. Um, Abby put in, I'm brand new to fundraising, so I have no idea what I like or what I don't like. Excited to work on all the options. Now that's a very positive, healthy mindset, Abby. So glad to have you here. You gotta take that car for a test drive in all the different areas of fundraising, and then you can start cultivating those preferences. Um, but thanks to y'all so much for chiming in there, and I'm looking forward to having more discussion later. Um, and yeah, meeting with donors individually, I love too. I got the most charming invite from a donor last week. She invited me to come over to meet her new puppy, and she said she would teach me how to play pickleball. So, you know, I'm pretty excited about that. Two things that I like to do. Uh, so I'm just going to do a quick recap. Uh, Greg, could you go to the next slide? Um, I know y'all got like a great update on this. So I'm just going to do a quick recap uh, from last week, just so that we're all on the same page about what we'll be talking about in the major categories of a development plan. So you have, of course, individual givers who um, those gifts can come really from anywhere. That can be a general donation. That can be a major gift, depending on what that is said at your organization. You could be doing an appeal or a campaign. You might code that as an individual gift. You have, of course, corporate uh, funding, which that can look like so many different things. So you have sponsorships, you have in-kind gifts, you have employee giving, which I think is really low-hanging fruit that folks should be going after more robustly now. You have grants, which I don't like, and but luckily Judy is here to give y'all, you know, some insight if you need it. And of course, government contracts, events, uh, program fees. Program fees are going to be, you know, if you are charging folks like a museum fee or something and you're getting some kind of service. And then unrelated business income, which I think someone also had put in the chat. If you're doing something that's not really related to your mission, but you're still somehow generating revenue off of it, uh, you could be selling t-shirts. And don't forget about other corporate gifts that are also weird, like Amazon Smile or anything that doesn't really neatly fit into other boxes. Um, so I just wanted to share some thoughts on that. I mean, I think my special event tip that's going to be the best is just the general reminder, y'all, when you're planning these tactics, that your event does not have to look like what everybody else is doing to be successful. I have seen so many nonprofits lose money um, in doing a gala. Design the event that really is going to make sense for you and your mission. And don't be shy to think, you know, bigger and think creatively. You know, I guess I was coming up um, in fundraising when, you know, that red carpet gala at the hotel hotel ballroom was like the end all be all of fundraising dinners and audiences are kind of over it I mean the roles that they serve at these hotel galas they're not great okay those carpets not great I mean people are just really looking for I don't know if you have an out of the box idea that doesn't neatly fit into the kind of fundraising events you've been seeing other groups do, that doesn't mean that it can't be incredibly successful. I think there's a real thirst um, on behalf of donors for things that are more organic, for things that are going to allow them to do that relationship building. And that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, wearing like a whole gown and like paying the 250 for a ticket. Small events can really offer um, a really kind of special intimacy that, and it, that large events just just can't. So if your budget is just like, that's not going to work for me, you absolutely don't have to do it. Um, and then for individuals, you know, I think you really have to lean into that communication piece, which I'm going to get into in a little bit. Greg, could you move the next slide, please? So first, a good first place to start would be um, asset mapping. I think asset mapping is so powerful because, I mean, when I was a baby fundraiser, I got like, I was just very overwhelmed at all of the different things <laughs> that I could possibly be doing and somehow like paralyzed. How can I possibly manage, you know, and juggle all of these balls? You know, there's a lot of possible avenues and they all require their own prospect research, relationship building, planning and follow through, potentially, you know, contracting expertise if you don't necessarily have it in-house. And if you're a small development team, even if you're the only person doing development work, um, you're just not able to do everything and you shouldn't be doing everything. It's really just not the best use of your labor. Um, when you are juggling all that stuff, it means you're probably not able to execute, you know, the things that you could really be leaning into successfully. 
And so I think, you know, using a strength-based approach can really help you uh, lead you more organically to developing the specific fundraising tactics that are going to match up with what you're plotting out in your development plan. So when I'm doing development planning, um, I have a goal, of course, like I want to improve donor retention by X percent, or I want to, you know, make sure lapsed donors are renewing that gift. I'm focusing specifically on people who did donate two years ago to my urine campaign, but didn't do it last year. And I wanna to try to woo those people back with a SMART goal that's also measurable. So how do I plan to do that? Look at your resources, um, look at your people. I would bet that everyone um, participating today has a lot more resources than you might immediately think you are. You know, do you have people hours? Do you have volunteers that are ready to like show up and roll up their sleeves um, and are interested in doing lots of different kinds of tasks? Does your board member's wife work at a place that does employee giving and might be able to give your application a boost? Does your board member's wife work at Best Buy and can get you a nice big flat screen TV for an auction? you know you have you have those resources and so um, I like you know email campaigns because there's not necessarily a cost attached to them depending on what platform you're using you know personal touch um, yeah I think there's been a real resurgence for me and like people wanting to talk on the phone I think lingering as a result of COVID and just that sense of people being disconnected what is your storytelling and messaging look like if you're doing snail mail are y'all all enrolled you know in like uh, USPS's bulk mail for nonprofits? you know if you're sending pieces of mail to over 250 people you get that price discount are you using the system in that way to make it work for you um, and of course social media so that's going to lead us to our next slide, Greg. So let's take a minute here. Um, I would love for you to just kind of jot down what are some of your organizational strengths and tools? Where are you feeling the most energy when it comes to your development plan? Um, let thinking about what you have in your corner really lead you to how could that naturally translate to a fundraising activity? So let's take a minute to just think and then I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring it back and hopefully someone feels comfortable speaking up and getting a, getting our little chit chat going. I mean, of course the chat is also available, but I'm not gonna be responsible for butchering the tone when I read it out loud. So let's just take a minute to write out organizational tools. Okay, and we're coming back, back to the group now. Um, does anyone want to say out loud where you're feeling the most energy or was there, is there a particular resource that you think your organization is bringing to the table? What are y'all good at, do you think? And you're also welcome to put it in the chat. But I will judge you 10% for doing that. I can share. Yay. And I'll put my hand on. Um, I, because I don't like talking about myself, I'm going to, I'm going to mention, I have a, a staff team member who has really, when I came on a few years ago, she just really expressed a lot of interest and excitement in writing our, uh, our annual uh, appeal letters. And that is something that personally I despise. That's my hives thing. Um, but she loves that. And we have, she has so much energy on that. And over the course of the past few years, we've been able to sort of move move her more and more into that annual giving space and she just has so much energy and excitement around the annual giving and like the monthly giving and all of that stuff so I'm really trying to sort of cultivate that that energy in her because she loves that stuff and I, I hives that stuff so oh thank you so much for sharing and that is an incredible asset I get so many appeal letters if an appeal letter can even inspire me to read it all the way through I'm like that is a special 
that is a, an amazing, incredible professional over there. I'm going to get, no one is allowed to steal my staff member. (laughs) Right. (laughs) All right. No poaching, new rules. This is a safe space. Um, would love to hear. Thank you so much for sharing. Would love to hear from someone else. Um, something you're really good at. Where do you feel the most energy? Um, and I love how you co- did that spotlight on a staff member also. So if y'all have some real champions, we did agree no poaching. Someone just raised their hand. You can definitely unmute and share. I think it's Robert, so. Hey, thanks for that invite. Um, I would also highlight other people on my team and not myself. I'm more of the writer uh, aspect, but uh, my team is extremely good at conversations and in uh, giving an overview of what our organization does, uh, own it, building black wealth. Um, And they oftentimes get donations right there without even asking for them. Um, That's been their strength. And I think uh, we're trying to build around that core. I mean, that's an amazing call out, Robert. I think it it takes such a talent to be able to solicit and have that be authentic, you know, and warm and not have anybody ever feel some type of way about it. That takes a lot of emotional intelligence. You've clearly got some stellar staff members on your side. Looking looking good over there. Um, Thanks so much, y'all, for sharing. And again, you can definitely put it in the chat as well. Um, But Greg, I'm ready to move on to the next little chunk here. So assuming if you've done that pre-thinking work, you know, leading with a strength-based approach, writing down what you're naturally bringing to the table, um, what things you could potentially lean into. I like to, at this point in my development plan, then marry it just with a general sketch of how that could relate to cash flow. So this is an example that I drafted up for an organization where their individual appeals goal for the fiscal year is $27,000. And you can see it broke it down by month. Here's where they're expecting to get that cash. And then next to it, you know, they're just generally putting what particular tactic or activity is helping. When you marry it with a calendar in this way, you're able to get a bigger view and also spot to see what kind of gaps you might be having. So they're like, oh, okay, September and October, they're going to do a a pretty robust workplace employee campaign, going to be signing up a lot of direct givers that way. Um, And then they're also following that up with a newsletter that might also have a soft ask. And so that kind of explains why they're getting a little bit of a bunch there. And I'm like, okay, we've got the year-end campaign going on here. Um, But, you know, for like that particular organization adding cocktail hour after kind of doing the exercise and saying, you know, we don't really have stuff for February. Should we do something in February? What could that look like? What would be fun to do after the campaign that happened? And so, you know, don't, when you add it up with a calendar this way and write out, write out your tactics, you know, along with that cash flow, give yourself an explanation for when you're anticipating that funding and why. And that will also help you work backwards from those solicitations. If you're planning on ask, if this group is doing a soiree in spring. So if they're planning on having their big gala then and asking folks to make significant donations then, what do they need to be doing six months before that event in terms of relationship building, sending out information, updating data to make sure that, you know, they think folks will be in a good place and would be receptive to an ask. So planning backwards from those solicitations keep, you know, can help. Can you move to the next one? And next, don't forget about communication. Y'all got to be communicating, all right? Um, relationship building, you know, we know, and I know you've heard this before, it is the heart of fundraising. Um, and it's impossible to do relationship building without communication. That is, you know, the main element, you know, when um, when folks were just sharing things that they had energy on and things that they were doing well, you can, you'll notice, you know, it was folks who were had stellar writing skills, folks who were really com- comfortable talking to people in person. Um, and so, you know, it's impossible to do our jobs without having those good communication skills. So um, I think a lot of groups get really siloed. They're like development work, only development work. Depending on the size of your shop, you may not have a separate communication arm. You may not have, you know, a consultant on board able to produce these things for you. Um, and what is an appeal but a letter that you have written down because you're communicating. So even if you don't have a big budget, you know, certain elements of communication like phone calls or emails, these are things that are not going to be able to, they, you know, they won't forsake you. They're always going to be in your back pocket. So think about how that syncs up with your development plan and weaves through and around all of your different tactics. So first, I like to ask groups, you know, consider how much of your content is passive and how much of your content is active. Passive content is the stuff I can find out about you that is static without you doing anything. So if I'm looking online at your website, um, 
if you have a newsletter posted, if I just Google you, this is stuff that, you know, is always available about you that you're not updating all the time. Um, active content is stuff that you are sending out that could potentially interrupt my day um, is a way to think about it. So if I'm eating my sandwich at lunch and I notice I got an email from you, I would not have sought out your information, you know, without somebody sending me something first. And so there's two separate different ways you can think about it. Um, so if you're not getting results in your tactics, look to your messaging and think about how you can add more of a robust section of communication or marketing um, to your development plan. For instance, does your content do your mission justice is a great place to start. Is it connecting with folks? Um, you can find a lot of information to assess what's if your materials are working, like doing A-B testing, um, for example, to help guide you. But you absolutely can't forget about doing some of these pieces. So, you know, there's a lot of resources around like segmenting communication. Um, I think direct mail can be like really expensive to do. Can you do more of a limited run? You know, I do like a special val Valentine's Day postcard to only individuals, very small, and I put hearts on them, you know, but not everybody on my list is going to be getting it. And here's a tip I wish, something I wish I was brave enough to do years in the past. Um, make sure you're staying on top of that email list and do not be afraid to ditch folks that haven't, be in, that haven't been engaged in a long time. And I know this kind of can sometimes go against conventional wisdom, but y'all, it is freeing to have a list that is effective in one, one where people are engaging with you and one where you're not wasting, you know, your money when you're sending that mail out is going to be so much better and preferable to having folks on there who haven't even open if they haven't opened an email in three years not even one email in three years there's just not that connection there you know your time would be better spent um acquiring you know a new folk who could really have that who could be interested in developing that relationship um so that's something that i wish i knew earlier i was just too afraid before to curate my list, but stay on top of it. And I also love to ask people, you know, when it comes to communication, do you have space to be a thought leader? What does it look like to really participate in your community? You cannot underestimate the value of community engagement strategy that goes along with your development plan. What are the regional papers and blogs look like for you? What are those op-eds look like? Um, who, could, who could be a good person to send that forward? Building a media list, I know it sounds aspirational depending on where you're at, but there will be a time you will need it and so it's good to know who's covering those various beats so in our last couple of minutes i just like to ask one more discussion question greg darling so it's the end of the year it's coming how do you think you can use marketing or communication to give your campaign a boost i can't see anyone it's raised hand so if you've got something to contribute you're welcome to just pop on the wheel or put it in the chat. How do you think you can use communication to strengthen your development campaign? So I'll jump in, Nina, if that's okay. Um, the, the things that we did at a domestic violence agency um, was a couple of things. One was really being able to share what our needs were as we got towards the end of the year and being really clear about that. And then it's also some of the successes we made, particularly from an advocacy standpoint in what laws have changed and the impact of those laws on our clients and our community. So it was somewhat in informational and educational, but it was also around what did we still have needs around that they would be very impactful in being able to contribute to and make a difference in. So at least that was the topic of what we talked about, not necessarily the vehicle that we used. Thank you so much, Judy. And I see Robert put in the chat, um, tell stories offered by satisfied stakeholders, new homeowners, donors, parents. Yes, yeah, storytelling is a critical segment of communication and I mean, I think we're all on a journey always to how can our store, how can we tell stories that really connect with people, um, that make people not only factually understand what it is you technically do, but one that also resonates and stands out from the crowd. Greg, can you go to the next slide? 
Um, so, and I'm sure uh, the powers that be behind the webinar will be sending out a roundup of resources potentially as a follow-up, but just a couple of quick uh, tools that I think really can work. If y'all have not tried peer-to-peer -peer giving, I would really recommend you give that a try. I think the pandemic has also seen tremendous growth in peer-to-peer -peer tools. Uh, give Lively. There are so many different tools where, you know, you're paying like for the credit card processing fees, but not for like a subscription. So you're welcome to, you could also try it out. You you know, one particular event, um, different event tools. Charity Auction Today also does like a great, they have a great, strong, cheap, free, robust virtual auction platform. So if y'all are still not all the way back to in-person events, that's a tool that could really help. Um, so there's so many great things around cultivation plans for individuals. And I also think like, you know, when you're really running out of that inspiration, try looking at your data in a different way and seeing how that married with a strengths-based approach, you know, can really help guide you. So if you notice that you have a lot of donors that are giving, you know, in the $50 range every few months, it might maybe just make sense to cultivate like a monthly giving program and put a little energy into that and see kind of how that goes. Um, what does your retention look like at different fundraising levels? Um, and of course, refreshing that messaging. I think again, as I said, we're just always constantly on a journey, at least I definitely am, of how can I continue to make content that's gonna do justice to the incredible work and the incredible participants in our program? Um, and what does it look like to really center, as Robert said, center those stakeholders, center those new homeowners, donors, partners. And so that way there's just so many different elements of your message that's being crystallized. So I just wanna thank y'all so much for taking the time to spend with me today. I hope anything that I said was really helpful. And I'm just so impressed and feel so great about the talent um, that is in this room. And it seems like all y'all do have such stellar members on your team. So maybe I might have to break that poaching rule after all. So just send me a LinkedIn request. Super safe. Thanks so much. Oh, Nina, 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 Nina. Oh, I, I hope you all have fallen in love with Nina. <laughs> she, uh, her and I have known each other for quite a while and she's always offers so much. So thank you for joining us today. Uh, now I'm going to hand everything off to Judy. Hello, Judy. Hi. Good morning, everyone. Nina, you are the energizer bunny. We're going to kind of do a little shift in energy level. I don't even think on, you know, like my most caffeinated day, I'm as energized as Nina is. Um, but thank you for your wonderful words of wisdom. And I think there's, you know, as I was listening to Nina's presentation and as we talked prior to this time together, um, I think there's really three important things to remember from her presentation that you'll see kind of my case study build off on. And the three things are belonging, that donors really want to belong in many instances to whatever cause you're, you're representing. And so how do you develop that relationship? How do you develop that sense of belonging with your donors? Um, the other part that uh, Nina talked about generally that I think is really important to stress is planning. And we're gonna talk a lot about that in just a minute, but that really planning is really important with your revenue models and that you're not gonna be able to get to where you wanna go without having clear plans in place, but plans that you can also adjust when you get new information and when you need to. And then finally, I really loved her strengths-based approach. That certainly resonates for me from a, a clinical side, um, but really being able to leverage your strengths uh, in what you do well from a fundraising perspective. So I think those are really three themes that we're going to continue on with in just a few minutes. Um, my um, word of um, advice uh, is to, you know, throughout these, these whole, all of this, this series um, that you've been participating in, there's been some really great information. And I find that when I've been the participant of these kinds of uh, series, I want to do all 25 things that I've learned in these series. And my uh, recommendation to you would pick one or two things that you've learned from this, this, this series and make a commitment to do those in the next three to six months. And then pick another one or two things in the next quarter or next two quarters that you're gonna work on. And all of a sudden you're gonna see some great movement in your development plans and great movement in your revenue models. If you just take a look at this at one bite at a time. 
So um, I wanted to start off with this quote, a goal without a plan is just a wish, because I really believe that to be true. And, and it's about how do you take what those hopes and dreams are and turn those into an action plan, but also it's around how do you align everybody um, with the work that you're doing, whether you're the executive director or the development director. And before I go any further, just a real kind of um, brief uh, introduction of me, so you kind of know where I'm coming from. I've spent um, 35 years, more than I care to admit, uh, in the nonprofit space. Uh, most of those years as executive director or CEO, a lot of the case study material that you'll see today uh, actually references two particular organizations that I led, which was a domestic violence agency called Family Shelter Service, and then a child welfare child welfare agency called 360 Youth Services. I now serve um, as a clinical therapist in private practice, um, but I've had quite a bit of experience um, development side, but also as the executive director. So Greg, if you wouldn't mind going to the next slide, what we're gonna cover in uh, the next 15 minutes, which is a lot, uh, is the importance of strategic planning, um, really to continue this idea that you can't be everything to everyone, that like Nina said, have the courage to really focus on those revenue models or those revenue items that you do really well and strengthen those. The third item will be, how do you look at the things that you see that seem to be this elephant that you would really rather get rid of and turn it into revenue for you? The importance of being able to anticipate trends because that's gonna inform your plans. And then finally developing a culture of philanthropy. I just thought this last quote, it was actually of somebody um, I knew, uh, CEO of a very large uh, manufacturing organization. And he said to me, he goes, I would never want your job. It is way too difficult to run a nonprofit. It is much more complex to do uh, fundraising for a nonprofit than I believe sales of a for-profit organization. It's pretty forward. Uh, you sell something, you get the money back. With uh, raising revenue for a nonprofit, there's all of these competing, potentially competing interests that you have to navigate. And so your job is a really difficult job to manage all of those expectations and interests. So uh, next slide, Greg. So strategic planning, what does that have to do with revenue models? So the plan that Nina shared with you and the kind of the beginning uh, structure of that plan really plugs into the strategic plan for an organization. So strategic planning is typically seen as something that you just do, check it off the, check that off your list of things to do and it sits on a shelf. But that's not really strategic planning. Strategic planning really drives everything in the organization, right? It drives your development plan. It drives your staffing plan. It drives your capital improvement plan. It drives all of these other um, aspects of the organization. And it gets everybody in conversation around where are we heading and how are we going to get there? And so it brings everybody into agreement and alignment around what's that final destination? How are we going to get there? So that if somebody wants to take a detour, you have the framework to be able to say, no, we can't go and chase that money because we've already agreed, here are the things we're going to focus on. So strategic planning is really key to be able to be very clear about the re revenue models that you want to chase after. So let's um, go to the next slide. So this was the strategic plan or a one-paid strategic plan for Family Shelter Service. So that was the domestic violence agency that we ran. And uh, we uh, were really clear about um, it being a succinct one page. We had pages behind this that staff would review on a monthly basis where we're at in different key items, like what's our progress on the specific tasks that we're gonna fulfill all of these goals that you see under action now and action later. So that would be reviewed by staff on a monthly basis. And then we would review this with staff on a quarterly basis, or excuse me, with the board on a quarterly basis. And the board was an integral part in making this plan happen. This wasn't just a directive to staff, and then they wash their hands of this. This is something that the um, um, 
board actually had goals that they were responsible for. This, um, and I think there was a question which I'd like to address right away. Um, Mike, I think you were asking about how long did this take to develop? This particular plan took about six months in total with the tasks attached to it. So there was probably about 12 pages of actual very specific task items that staff developed. Um, it, that, took, that whole process took about six months. I will say we were evolutionary in this process. So this was not our first strategic plan for this organization. We, my, my goal when I started with the organization back in 2014 was to get to a one page strategic plan to be able to have that level of detail on our critical success factors. So to really get it refined, it took us two attempts to get to this kind of strategic plan. Um, the, if we can just jump back, um, Greg, um, there's a couple of items on here that you'll see really drove the revenue models. So you'll see under action now, the very first item was to develop a cultural philanthropy to increase non-governmental funding. So in Illinois, which is where I currently live and where I've worked for most of my career or all of my career, um, we just came off of in 2017, a nearly 800 day state budget impasse where we the, the state government operated without a budget for more than a year which impacted us because a lot of our funding, nearly 50% of our funding at that point in time came from government sources. And so we had to, our cash flow was really struggling and we had a lot of kind of maneuvering parts um, or kind of like robbing Peter to pay Paul in order to make it through that year without a budget because without that budget, agencies weren't getting any kind of funding. And so in some respects, this was reactionary, um, but we didn't want to have that level of reliance on government funding. So for us, being able to really advance corporate giving um, and foundation giving were really huge initiatives to be able to balance our um, non-governmental and governmental revenue, which you'll see is number six on the, crit the critical success factors. And it's also addressed in, in number three, where it says increase months of Luna to six months. What Luna is, is liquid unrestricted net assets. So it's just another way, it's more of a accounting way to say, um, what is your unrestricted cash on hand pretty much? And um, we really wanted to be able to increase that to give us some cushion if this were to ever happen again, if we were to ever be in a place where government contracts were not being paid on. Okay, if we can go to the next item or the next slide. So um, I wanna talk a little bit about this, don't be everything to everyone. I know that we hear conflicting opinions about this, right? Some people say it's really important to diversify and you need to have really strong um, revenue in all of the different categories. I come from the perspective, and, and Nina does as well, where you really look at what you do well and you leverage that. For us, we had a strong governmental um, line item that came with a lot of risks and we experienced that with the budget impasse. And uh, we were able to take some steps to begin to strengthen some other areas which we were good at, but we really needed to increase those areas like corporations and foundations. We found out at Family Shelter Service, for example, that individuals, we could not um, go back and look to our alums to be able to increase our, give, our individual line item. And by alums, what I mean is those people who used our services, didn't, uh, no longer needed um, our services and were considered alums of our program. We couldn't go back and ask them because in Illinois, we have very restrictive uh, confidentiality laws that protect victims of domestic violence in perpetuity. And so to go back and send a letter, an appeal letter to a victim of domestic, a former victim of domestic violence asking for their su support would violate the very laws that continue to protect them. So inherently we had some issues 
with some of our ways of being able to raise money, which meant our individual line item would never be a strong line item. But our corporate giving, we really found a way to get into corporations with what we called this bathroom project post, uh, a bathroom poster project um, initiative where we would approach businesses to put posters in their women and men's bathrooms about domestic violence and where to reach out if um, they were experiencing domestic violence. And so in a very non-threatening way, we were be able to begin to establish a relationship with a corporation, which in many instances led to funding from corporations. Um, usually the, the progress went, we would get in there with this bathroom project poster or poster project. I always don't do that well or don't say that well. And then we would be able to see, get people to volunteer. So come and um, help uh, re-landscape and, and redo our flower beds around some of our shelters or our transitional housing. And so we'd have groups of volunteers come out and be able to do that once a year. So that was a way to be able to get corporations to learn more about us. And then the next step would be for us to be able to ask them for money. And a lot of times we found um, even uh, particularly when they were coming out to volunteer uh, for the corporate kind of days um, that uh, we'd hear stories, stories of a colleague that experienced domestic violence and, and how that abuser came out to where the person was working and it was a threatening situation to everyone involved. And so it was really a way to be able to get more connected with organizations and learn more of their stories and how they related to domestic violence. Um, and then just like Nina said, it takes courage to turn down an opportunity. Again, at Family Shelter, we had an instance in which uh, a funder, a longtime foundation, which would um, support our prevention education program, uh, was really getting more and more specific about the curriculum that wanted to be used. And that philosophically was very different than how we saw um, domestic violence. And so for very clear philosophical reasons, we made a conscious choice not to pursue that uh, funder uh, again. And it was really important for us, if you um, recall the uh, strategic planning side, we were very clear about our values. And we use that to be able to make decisions, particularly as it related to revenue. And so when either a foundation or a funder was, a, was uh, not in alignment with our values, it was a little bit easier for us to be able to make that decision, that courageous decision, not to pursue an opportunity that we had uh, maybe had a longstanding relationship. Next slide, please. So um, I think some of the important questions to consider, so this kind of um, uh, plays off of uh, Nina's slide on that kind of um, uh, assessing your assets um, is to, to look at some of these questions. What are our major fundraising or funding efforts? What's worked well? What hasn't worked well? And to really be able to have honest conversations around that. Um, sometimes these are difficult conversations to have because um, these are there are there can be sacred cows for folks in the organization. Um, the the gala that can't be touched because we've always had that um, certain event. And there are always going to be life cycles for all of these funding efforts. And to be very clear and very open and direct about when a uh, fundraising effort has reached its potential and is actually on the downside and costing the organization more money than it's actually bringing in, if that's a goal for that particular effort, right? Sometimes, not sometimes, but for us at Family Shelter and as well as 360 Youth Services, we knew that special events was never going to be a way to raise money for us. And so it was important to use that as a way to bring new people to the, to the cause and to our organization. So it was a different um, 
strategy for our special events. Um, so I think these are just helpful questions that we've wrestled with in the past, both at 360 and at Family Shelter, and maybe some framework for how you can um, assess what your strengths are, what your opportunities are. Okay, next slide. So the turning lemons into lemonade, one of the things uh, that happened at Family Shelter Service is, so we provided um, how, uh, we were a 24 seven operation, we provided housing, um, we provided um, uh, emergency shelter, we had the hotline for our county um, for victims to be able to call into counseling case management. So a wide variety of ser services. And one of the things that uh, we, uh, had always needed were in-kind donations or some kind of, you know, could be food, clothing, toiletries, because many times clients were coming to us with literally the clothes on, our, on their backs. And so how do we get them kind of restarted so that they can continue their life as, they've, as they're leaving an old life? And so what that meant was, is we literally had a mountain of clothing, of donated clothing items very gracious, generous community, but we really didn't, we had way more clothing than we had clients that could, could use them. And so we ended up taking all of that mountain of clothing where we were kind of just like, it was a blessing and a curse all in the same, same space and uh, decided to open up a resale shop in our area. And uh, we had some luck in that we hired a very talented uh, resale shop manager right out of the gate. Um, but quickly, that resale shop would give us about $250,000 a year net income that was completely unrestricted. One of the ways that it did not become an unrelated um, business income stream for us was our clients were able to shop there for free. So they were able to go and have an experience shopping um, and being able to be just like everybody else in the store and take what they wanted and needed to be able to start their own life as just a regular kind of program for any client uh, who used our services. And then we had a very industrious board member who uh, um, really was um, very focused, laser focused, about getting us to be one of the um, uh, charities that would benefit from the International Houseware Show that would happen in Chicago every year. And so any of the items that vendors did not wanna have shipped back because it was just too costly to ship back to wherever their headquarters were, we would actually get for free and then every year have a three-day pop, uh, three pop-up sale that would bring us in net $60,000 every year with new items. And again, it was a way to um, bring our message to a broader audience um, because of the appeal of selling new items from the International Housewares show. So all that to be said is sometimes the thing that um, really is um, um, your, your greatest um, thorn in your side can really turn into be such a great resource. And then just two quick points to make is, I think it's really important for the executive director as well as your uh, CFO or your kind of chief um, financial officer and your chief development officer to be anticipating trends. Uh, nonprofit agencies are a lagging indicator. They're not a leading economic indicator. And so you do have some time to be able to adjust your plan when you know what's happening in other segments uh, in the economy. So for me, knowing what's happening in manufacturing, knowing what's ha happening in other industries is really helpful, particularly since we had such a strong corporate giving line item. It helped me know what's going on in their world so that I knew maybe 12, 18 months down the road, I would need to adjust based on what they're looking like. So if their sales are lagging, then 12 to 18 months down the road, I might need to adjust my corporate giving number down because manufacturing companies are having a, a tough time um, with their sales. So 
it's really important to be aware of the financial trends, I believe. Some of the ways that you can do that is there's Renaissance executive forms. That was a form group that I've belonged to in the past. They usually um, allow nonprofits to have a membership that is really, really, really affordable for nonprofits. Um, and you're usually with a bunch of corporate, um, corporate owners. But again, it gives you that inside information on what's happening on a corporate level so that you're able to adjust down the road. There's other organizations that you can join, industry organizations, such as for me, it's the Illinois Coalition Against Domestic Violence. The other thing is this is a great thing if you have an advisory council, if you've got a president's council, to be able to bring those folks who might be on that advisory council around the table and share with you what are those business leaders seeing as economic trends so you're able to adjust as a board and staff. So it's a great way to use an advisory council. And I know sometimes it's really difficult to figure out how do you really utilize an advisory council. Next slide. And I'm getting close. I'm, I hope I'm not running over time. Just a few words on, on donor relations. Um, it's really important, I think, to build a culture of philanthropy. Like Nina said, a lot of times uh, uh, board members and staff think that raising money is just a development department or a development person's job, and it's not. It's everybody in the organization. And we all take different parts, right? So the development department and the executive director are people who should be making the ask and leading the charge. But you need people like board members being able to share why they're so connected and so invested in the organization. You need board members opening doors. You don't need them to make an ask, but you do need to um, really get your board members to open doors and to demonstrate their commitment to the organization. You also need program staff uh, being a part of, of fundraising events. Nobody can tell a better story about clients than your program staff. And there's nobody better who can be answering questions from donors than program staff. And so their participation in this cultivation pro um, process is really key. Real quick, I see like there's three kind of big buckets that follow the giving pyramid um, where you try to figure out kind of how much money you're going to get from each level of donors. From a, from a donor relation perspective, that transactional level, that's kind of just that, just what it sounds like. You're not at this relational level with your donors. You're at this tra transactional level. This is where you need to do all of those fundamental things right about stewarding a donor. So your thank you notes are coming out timely. You've got really clear information on what the return on investment is for those donors. It's all of those basic fundamentals. The next step when you move up that pyramid with your donors is relational. This is where that relationship piece that Nina has talked so much about is so important. I loved her example of being invited to meet a donor's puppy and to be taught how to play pickleball. That's that relational piece. So how do you deepen that connection and what are those strategies to help deepen the connection with your donors? For us, uh, we did um, uh, Valentine's Day cards to our donors, but we actually had our clients who wanted to write thank you notes, write thank you notes and write Valentine's Day cards to our donors. And that was one way to deepen our relationship. We picked some really key donors and had them write, um, uh, or we had really key uh, donors and we had clients write uh, thank you notes to those key donors. And then that transformational piece, that's how do you get people who are gonna be your raving fans? This is where that peer-to-peer -peer fundraising happens. And it happens somewhat organically, but it's gonna come from your raving fans, people who want to raise money with an event that they do on your behalf. So think about those strategies, moving people from this transactional to transformational on the, the pyramid. And last slide, I hope I didn't go over. Um, just a couple of resources that I've um, used um, pretty regularly. Uh, the first two are books, but they, um, the sustainability mindset um, is a real good kind of um, structure 
for how you go about looking and assessing your assets. It's really very helpful. And then like uh, Mike, you said in, your, in the chat, board source is just a great, great resource. You do have to pay a fee for it, but uh, the, the number of times I've used their, their resources has been just uh, fantastic. So it's a really great um, resource. So wonderful to be with everybody. Um, thanks for the invitation to be a part of this and at least share some of the uh, insights. And I'm gonna turn it back to you, Greg, thanks. Thank you so much. Um, I just wanna acknowledge, Mike, you, you did mention a couple of things. Let's uh, come back to that for the Q and A's because I think that everyone in here might have some other thoughts on your um, questions and points. So we are going to uh, go on to Emily, Emily Will's video and um, enjoy. Okay, sorry about that. Um, Michaela, do you have any? Might have to share audio. Okay. Um, there we go. Sorry about that, everyone. reach out via email or LinkedIn with questions um, and I'm happy to chat further. Uh, a little bit about me, I have a background in theater and arts. Um, I was an education person, I was a teaching artist for many years. Um, then I actually found my way into development through volunteering. I volunteered for a gala for a theater organization that I was a part of. And um, a few months later, they invited me to join their development team and I've been in the development world ever since. My husband and I moved to Madison in the fall of 2019. Um, he was attending law school and I uh, kind of got dragged here kicking and screaming, but I, I joke that it's been really wonderful. We've fallen in love with Madison. Um, I found a really wonderful community here. Love the work that I do with Wisconsin Youth Company. And if you aren't a member already, um, I will give the Association for Fundraising Professionals uh, a shout out. The Greater Madison Chapter is amazing. I've met so many wonderful people, several of whom have been instrumental in finding ways to put together a development plan. Um, so I lovingly refer to our first years uh, developing our program as throwing noodles at the wall. Um, Wisconsin Youth Company is uh, about 50 years old, was founded in the 1970s, and um, up until 2019 or 2020 um, had never had a development program, had never made an appeal or um, really had a sustainable development programs or practices. So I was hired on um, March 16th of 2020. Uh, you may remember that as the day everything shut down. That was the day COVID hit uh, our neck of the woods and schools closed, offices closed. Um, everything really went dark uh, in a way. So a really interesting time to be starting to plan development um, and also a really interesting time to join an organization and be new to um, a nonprofit uh, and get to know it virtually first. Um, during the global pandemic, it was really a good time to try new things, uh, hence throwing noodles at the wall. Um, and after about a year, 
that was finally when we had a time to reflect. So I, one of my biggest um, advice, pieces of advice would be uh, to give yourself time. It takes time to put a development plan into place. It takes time to see what works. It takes time to try it again or adjust it. Um, but all of it takes time. So now that we're here uh, in 2022, two years later, we have a lot more information to go off of as we develop our fundraising plan for the future. So I'll talk a little bit about what that looked like. Um, but our first year really felt kind of like this. <laughs> it felt a little discombobulated. It felt circuitous. It felt like there was no clear map or direction. Um, and around every corner, of course, was COVID. So some of the best practices or some ideas for engaging with donors and starting a development program didn't feel accessible, didn't feel reasonable in a time when we were all staying inside in our houses. Um, so really, it felt like there were more questions than answers, which was a really great time to innovate and try new things. Um, I was not grateful for it in the moment, but looking back at it, I am definitely grateful for it now. Um, and again, those, those development standards, those, those tried and true methods did come into play and did wind up being a really helpful thing to sort of go back to and fall back on. Um, let me just move my video out of the way. I guess I can't, um, I'll fix that later. <laughs> um, one of the things that uh, was really impactful was having these like development standards, asks, thanks, stewardship, cultivation. Um, those really were our foundation and our groundwork for the first year. Um, they weren't necessarily laid out month by month. They weren't necessarily laid out week by week, but those were sort of the things that I focused on. Um, so the development plan for our first year really mostly looked like goals for what I wanted to achieve that first year, establishing a development program. Um, we sent out an email appeal, we sent out a mailed appeal, we established some really um, wonderful processes to thank donors. First time donors all get a phone call, second time donors uh, get a thank you note, and then uh, I sort of make a best judgment uh, from there based on the amount that someone's donated, their connection to the organization, um, that sort of thing. Uh, for stewardship, we established a donor newsletter that went out every month that we've continued. Um, we mailed some stewardship pieces. Again, it was the pandemic, so we couldn't get many people in person, but we wound up sending some postcards and some care packages um, and things like that just to stay connected with people, let them know we were thinking of them and um, hope that they were thinking of us too. And then also our annual report, um, sharing that with a wider audience uh, than we had before and just being able to say, here's what's been happening, um, I think was really helpful. And then for cultivation, we did hold one virtual event over uh, that 2020, 2021 year. Um, it was a varying success, depending on how you define success, we wound up, um, uh, we wound up not continuing with it, but um, we also invited people to stay involved. And then at the end of our year, we sent out a donor survey and we reflected as a staff and as a team, what went well, what needed to change. Um, and that was really helpful as well. Um, during our reflections, we would talk about how much bandwidth we had, what projects felt like we were strapped for time and didn't have enough planning put in place and when was our bandwidth really small and we just didn't get to it um, what outcomes were really worth the effort that we put into them what outcomes weren't worth the effort um, and then based on that we sort of started to or i sort of started to plan for the next year to see what could be repeated what should be replaced um, and going into 2021 2022 I pulled a document from a website. Um, I got this online, uh, just sort of a basic development outline that was already broken into these four categories, sort of governance tasks, communications, development, um, and grants. I think that says grants, yeah. Um, and it, this was helpful. It was a much better map than a bulleted list of goals to achieve. This gave me 
I broke it down by quarter and then broke it down further by month. Um, this gave me something more to focus on each month and to be able to see what was coming down the line. Um, it was helpful to have some more structure to the year. Although, as you might notice, the governance tasks and the communications are a little bit repetitive. Those are things that just happen every month. Um, and so I wound up feeling like some areas were not as helpful to list out in that regards as others. So you'll see uh, later on how I've adjusted this model um, to fit our organization just a little bit better. Um, after this second year, again, we reflected on what went well, what was unexpected, what was worth it, what should be repeated, what can be replaced. Um, all along uh, our first year and, and a little bit our second year, we looked at our income, but because this was only the second year of regular development processes, we didn't necessarily set a goal for fundraising. And A, I'm very grateful for that. And B, I think that is what led us to be able to make plans and try new things in a way that um, helps us grow to where we need to be. Uh, we just didn't know. We didn't have donors previously to say who are our repeat donors. This was our first year. We didn't have donors to say what's our retention rate. We didn't have donors to say, you know, what had been given in the past. So this year, the 2021-2022 year, is when we're first really able to look back and say, okay, what is our retention rate? What is our outreach look like? How are people engaging with us again? Um, and so some things that we considered also were just our team's bandwidth. Were there any moments, again, that I might be a one-person development shop, but I work very closely with our creative director and our communications director and our executive director, and anytime we write a grant, were there any moments that one person on that team felt like they had too much on their plate? Because we're all involved in different areas and, and have different hats to wear um, in our time. So looking back and talking about how we measure success, what worked, what didn't, what things got skipped on accident um, or on purpose because we just didn't have time. All of that was really helpful um, in talking about our reflections for the past year. Um, so thinking back on also how we set up our development plan, I had some pros and some cons for the spreadsheet style. I thought it was really helpful to have a map, I think. Planning some things out is really great. Having a written plan, regardless of whether you have to skip some things or move some things around. I printed mine out and jotted notes anytime something shifted or um, something else came up. So that was really helpful to be able to look back on. It's something to reference if you're wondering, you know, oh my gosh, I feel so swamped. One month you can look ahead and say, am I gonna be swamped again next month? Or vice versa, if you're feeling like, oh, I feel like I should be preparing for something, you can look ahead and start that process. Um, it's just more structured, which is always helpful. You can offer reference to someone else who might be working with you, working under you, working around you. Um, and some of the cons were, it just didn't feel detailed enough. It didn't feel like there was enough space to really go into the what, the how, the why. Um, and the categories didn't quite fit. Like I mentioned, those two governance processes and communications started feeling really repetitive after the first quarter. It was sort of the same thing over and over again. Um, and hard to gauge bandwidth if you don't know what's coming up or what you need to be preparing for. Um, so our process this year, our, our fiscal year runs from September to August. Um, so our process this year is just about, we'll see how well it works, but our process this year looked a little bit different. Um, this year, we have hired someone. So I have a development coordinator who works with me. She's wonderful. Um, and we got together in a room. We took about half a day to gather some sticky notes and colorful pens and cleared some space on a big whiteboard um, and just started going through the past two years of programs. Um, and looking at what campaigns we had done that we want to continue into 2022, 2023, what stewardship uh, pieces, events, programs we had done, what events for fundraising or stewardship we had done, what grants we were looking to apply for based on recent research. Um, and then pipeline and database were really helpful additions. I thought pipeline was something that I thought of would help us look at and see what was coming down the track. So pipeline is something you should be working on in 
April, May for a June event or uh, March for an April grant, um, that sort of thing. And then database was just ongoing upkeep uh, that's sometimes hard to schedule and put into your calendar unless it's listed out. So some of those things uh, were based on reflections from years past, goals for the coming year, and then new ideas we wanted to try. And we put them all on sticky notes and gave them each a color. Um, and then once we had all the sticky notes written out, we put those up on the board under different months. And then we could really see which months were feeling really heavy and which months were feeling really light. And we could move some of those campaigns or appeals or stewardship events around by a month or two months sometimes to see where would be the best spot for those that would give us bandwidth as a team to do our best and put that best effort forward and then also not get burnt out or overwhelmed. Um, and then we coupled it actually with a new piece. So this year we've got a spreadsheet broken out by the month and the activity. It's printable for easy reference. It still has those limited details, but we added on a narrative guide. Um, and this is actually a piece that was uh, sent to me. Um, this idea came from Creel Zeering. If you know Creel, um, she's wonderful. I've learned a lot and really appreciate her, um, her work and her advice. And the narrative guide is really wonderful. It goes in depth and breaks down each income stream and gives it more of a detailed description of why we're doing this, what the plan is for that thing, um, and sort of like past experiences, goals, strategies, um, all of that. So the narrative guide has been really helpful as sort of a reference point. You can look at the spreadsheet and see what's coming down calendar wise, but then the narrative guide gives you a little bit more background as to what's happening, why it's happening. Um, and I'll give you some examples of how that's laid out in a couple slides. So now our development spreadsheet looks a little bit more like this. Uh, got a lot more columns. Um, the rows are about the same and I do break them down by month. I don't just do quarter one, quarter two, quarter three. Um, I find it easiest that way for my brain. And then usually I'll put a date range or you know earlier in the month later in the month uh, just to give myself some visuals obviously i like color so <laughs> i color code it to the quarter um and that really helps me um sort of suss everything out and see what needs to be happening at a given time um and then the narrative like i mentioned it goes much more in depth so it breaks things down rather than by sort of activity, more by income stream. So individual giving, you might have a strategy for monthly giving. You might have a strategy for a fall appeal. You might have a strategy for um, a spring appeal. And then goals for each of those. You know, those could be monetary goals. It could be goals of who you would want to reach, who you would want your responses to, um, how large of a response you're looking for whether you'll send it by direct mail or email, um, and whether you're going to segment it or just sort of send it in one big wash. Um, grants, similarly, gives a little bit more information on previous amounts that have been awarded or if this is a new grant, um, any strategies or projects that you're planning to specifically apply for, and then engagement strategies, what the follow-up might be, what the relationship might be, especially if it's a foundation that you want to encourage that continued growth and engagement. Um, and then also events, what your goals are for an event, the strategy, important dates that might come up. Um, all of that is really helpful. Mine is currently a nine page document. I'm not quite done with it yet. So <laughs> these can get really extensive, but again, I find it to be a really helpful tool and a really wonderful thing to be able to share if there's someone else on your development team or in your organization uh, who's asking questions about what you're doing. You can give them this, you can show them, oh, this is what I've been thinking. This is why it's thought out. Um, and that just makes things a little bit more, um, gives me personally a little bit more confidence um, going into things. This is kind of what one of those might look like. Uh, for an example, for individual giving, you might have your strategy laid out um, that sort of discusses what you're planning to do for it. This will also give you a little bit of insight into how busy you might be preparing for it. If it's an email appeal, right, there's one less thing to do than a mailed appeal. You don't have to work with a mailing house or a printing house or um, get your you know, addresses all placed in the right order. You can just do emails. Um, 
goals also, um, you know, I like to think about email open rates. Am I giving it the right sort of um, topic or subject line? Um, what actions do I want people to take? Am I asking them to donate? Am I asking for a monthly donation? Um, all of those sorts of things are helpful to list as goals, I think. Um, and then for institutional giving or grants um, or that sort of thing, this is sort of an example of how I laid that out. Uh, this isn't a, a real institution. Um, I just made it up for, for this example. Um, but I really like being able to offer engagement also, sort of a reminder of like, oh, we should invite them to the stewardship event. Oh, we should send them an annual report with a personal note. All of that helps to maintain that relationship and really give you some guidelines um, for how best to cultivate that relationship. Okay, I hope I didn't go over uh, my allotted time, but um, planning does take time. Um, I really encourage folks to set aside time to schedule it. I think putting together all of the information, thinking through everything could take a week of uh, full days. So you could spread those out, do a couple days a week, do a couple half days at, over the course of a month. But it really does take time to sit down and think through what the best practice for your organization is going to look like and what the best um, efforts for your time and your energy are going to be. Um, and not everything will be a success, but I hope that you can give yourself space and grace to learn from it um, and sort of accept those as times where, you know, an event might take a year or two to get off the ground. So that first year might not hit all those goals, but the second year might do better and the third year might do better than that. Or one appeal might be a great prime for someone to give later on in the year. Um, so just continuing to think positively in that way, I think is really important for this work. Um, and just, I'd love to encourage you all to keep going and keep throwing noodles. I think that is one of the most joyful aspects of being in development is trying new things and finding new ways to connect with people and hopefully continuing to improve the world that we live in. Thank you all so much. I really appreciate uh, being able to uh, present and I hope you found it helpful. Uh, take care. Oh my gosh. I, I don't know about any of you, but the uh, throwing noodles, throwing uh, noodles against the wall and seeing what sticks was my exact philosophy going into the pandemic. And then also, nice shout out to Creole. <laughs> um, I am going to, we are going to open this up to questions, I believe. Hello, my name is Emily. I'm the development director as as for Wisconsin Youth. We go on to the next slide. Yes. So first, I think we should... Um, Mike, I want to touch on what you had mess messaged earlier about sharing templates and things. Um, I want to see what Judy and anyone else in here wants to say, but I will say when I'm working with clients, first, when I'm just consulting with them about strategic planning, I will first say before we sign a contract to bring me on to facilitate, look at all the templates, look at all of them, see what might work. What fits with you? Sometimes you just need a strategic map. Sometimes you need a whole plan. Sometimes you're really, and Judy and I talked about this earlier uh, last week. Sometimes it's really strategic foresight because you're thinking so far out. But I invite anyone, Creel, Judy, anyone else to uh, pipe in about that piece. I would just totally agree with that. I think it is very different based on the organization, based on your board, based a lot on your staff. Um, you know, early on in my career, I had, was doing strategic planning with a, a, a team and um, they would call the strategic plan the scary chart. And so, you know, it really is, it, it really, because it, we it was the first time for that organization, we were tracking progress on things. And so um, it is really about finding the template and the model that matches where your organization is at. So I totally would agree with what you're saying, Greg. The scary chart. Oh my gosh. Um, would anyone else like to add into thoughts on that? Or are there any other questions for Judy and Nina? I believe is back in here now. So. Uh, Mike, to answer your last piece. 
we will ask Emily if the template can be shared. So, um, Kristen, what is your what's your question? Hi, sorry, it's just taking everything to a moment to unmute and unvideo. Um, no video. So I'm just starting out with a nonprofit, and I guess I would love some background on what is stewardship exactly. Can't see Nina on my screen. So I think she may have had to jump onto a okay. meeting. So. So um, stewardship is is that kind of it, how do you um, build that relationship with the donor, um, and so how do you you know take somebody from that either you know mild interest in the organization to this kind of raving fan who not only is giving to your organization on a regular basis but also um, as somebody who is getting others to donate to your organization as well. So it's all of those steps in building the relationship. So it would be the thank you notes. It would be inviting them. Um, maybe it's, you know, we did shelter tours and um, inviting them personal invitations to uh, events, um, inside information, particularly around COVID, uh, we would do, when I was at the um, child welfare organization, we would do regular videos or I would do regular videos as to what was going on in the organization throughout the pandemic. Um, so it's how do you build that relationship with the donors so that they keep supporting your organization in increasing ways? Did that answer your question? Kristen? Absolutely, thank okay. you. 